So I'm supposed to talk to you about hardware hacking in the Netherlands. Um, whoever thought that I should be the person, I know this connection is coming through Wach. Uh, Peter, Peter van Bahema. Peter van Bahema, who's a colleague of mine working on AI and ethics at Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences, proposed that I should talk about hardware hacking in the Netherlands, as I'm supposed to uh, have an overview. Um, I wasn't taking into account that this would be a small screen with a large audience. Um, so I'm currently a research professor at Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences and worked in a number of open uh, hardware projects, uh, often as a kind of member of the advisory board, so people really think that I know a lot about open hardware. Uh, so this was the Open Next, Plastic Twist, the, the, the remodel. Open Next obviously was, was connected to VAG as well. The remodel, the Danish um, uh, project that actually try to involve industry uh, with open source and try various models there. I'm also a visiting professor at the Cooperative University of Amersfoort, which gives this whole university thing and open hardware a different uh, twist. I'll come back to that um, later in my presentation. I've also worked uh, or have relations to the Dutch Fab Lab Foundations. I've worked at Waag in Amsterdam a very long time ago, 2007 to 2009, worked in projects like Creative Commons, um, like the Fab Lab. So my job at the time was to turn the Fab Lab from a project into a facility, which obviously worked. Um, I've uh, worked in Scotland as well at uh, University of Aberdeen as a sort of technology transfer person. So uh, I was looking there at this whole thing from a sort of different angle. Um, did a lot of consultancy in my life with SMEs, with non-governmental organizations, with governments. And very back in the time when I was doing my master's in industrial engineering, I worked at Alstom as an industrial engineer hooking up big industrial robots to big industrial milling machines. And also did a, a, a number of, of arts projects and festivals and stuff like that. So there you go. Um, anybody of you using these kind of smart watches? Who's got a Fitbit? Yes. And you would be surprised that inside the Fitbit is open source hardware hacking that started in the Netherlands in 2008. Um, there was this... Uh, um, Guy, he, he was, he was on, a, on a student exchange from Canada to Delft and was irritated that his phone went buzzing when he, he was riding a bike. So I thought, there must be a, a solution to bring the buzzing phone to my armrest. And he started hacking uh, a Blackberry uh, combined with a Nokia display. And there was, this was the very first iteration of what became the Pebble which I still use, which was bought up by uh, Fitbit in 2000-something, can't remember, for 2.3 billions or something. Um, so open hardware hacking, that made it into your Fitbit. Um, that's him in 2008, Eric Migiofsky. Uh, another prototype, uh, which uh, you see even an Arduino in the back there doing uh, some kind of computational magic between the BlackBerry and the, 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 the Nokia phone, which he uses as a display. Um, this one just came out. It's called a Factor 4, an industrial 3D printer uh, made by Ultimaker, now the Dutch know Ultimaker. Uh, this is how Ultimaker started years ago. I think that was in 2000. 10 or something, so really like 14, 15 years ago, people in Utrecht, Protospace, which still existed at that time, uh, a fab lab, um, producing repraps. From the reprap, they modeled the protobox, the first instance of the Ultimaker, started really off as an open source project sharing designs with the community, integrating community improvements, particularly into the print head, 
Um, they didn't exactly go down the MakerBot route, um, who also started like an open source thing and then got venture capital in, closed down uh, uh, the whole project. Um, uh, uh, brought up by one of the big ones. Um, Ultimaker is still owned uh, by a Dutch uh, financial holding, which is part of another financial holding. And then this whole uh, family of financial things, it's interesting for the Dutch. Uh, Mammut, the heavy lifting uh, company is part of that. Hobeon, which we all know in education as one of the uh, certification agencies, is part of that same family. And Ultimaker is part of that same family. And of course, they came out with this completely closed source industrial uh, thing. Um, going all the way from, from open source hardware to, to industrial, and when it gets industrial, and when there is venture capital involved, the only, you know, the, the money you're exchanging in, in, in venture capital, and that's the trouble with the, with the tech transfer agencies, the money you exchange, the, the, the value you exchange here is your patents. So if you go with a pile of patents, you're worth a lot, even if those patents are probably mostly useless and just written not to protect your tech, but to expand your idea in as many areas of tech as possible. Uh, that's a different story. Um, another thing that uh, emerged from the open source hardware hacking community, this is a website called Revolver, which is currently used by many engineering companies, universities across the globe as a platform to collaborate on engineering designs. Started off by a guy, Bram Geenen, and he's still the guy behind the platform. So if you click on contact on Vivolver, you get an email, bram at vivolver.com. In um, 2012, he sent this email to the then still functioning um, uh, open design mailing list uh, run by the Open Knowledge Foundation. Hi, my name is Bram Geenen. I'm a project designer from Amsterdam. Together with friends, I'm developing an online collaboration platform that also allows people to open up their projects using Creative Commons and open source hardware licenses. So again, you know, starting in 2012 with this idea of open source and uh, moving into an industrial uh, platform that's apparently so robust that universities like, like Michigan, like ETH Zurich, and a lot of uh, professional engineering companies use this thing. Um, so I'm delving into uh, a few communities of, of open source hardware, and who knows where that is? You know. The others? No? You want to briefly tell me what it is? Yes, so CBase, they, they um, have this story that, uh, you, you, you know it, <laughs> yeah, right. So th they've got this story that this spaceship landed on Berlin and sort of went on the ground, and they are in that spaceship. It's, it's, it's really impressive, and the story is so consistent. So if, 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 you, if you've got the chance to go there and visit, do it. Have a tour, it's amazing. Yeah, the TV tower. <laughs> yes, the TV tower in, in formerly Eastern Berlin is, is the antenna of the spaceship. And they're sort of, they're called the mother of all hacker spaces. Um, started somewhere in, yep, long time ago. But really kind of, you know, the, this first space that brought this uh, this idea of, of, of hackerspaces together, which is not only open source hardware, and I think that resonates with uh, what you told us about, about GOSH. It's not only about the hardware, it's also about, a lot about having fun together. So I, I think this, this um, is, is an, an ingredient. Uh, now, uh, moving to the Netherlands, uh, the hackers uh, among us 
know those gatherings, but started um, in this kind of spaceship analogy with the Galactic Hacker Party, hacking at the end of the universe. Um, anybody studied uh, English literature among us? So this is, this is uh, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, ringing a bell there. Uh, hacking in progress, hackers at large, what the hack? And then sort of, in the 2009, 2013, 2017, 2022, 20, moving in those uh, computer and security acronyms. You know, oh, oh yeah, we know that from, from electricity. Um, it stands for Observe, Hack, Make. Um, they're coming up with a next edition next year. Why? Uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting. Um, the, the, the full name is uh, What Hackers Yearn. So, but you know, this question why? What are we doing here in, 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 in hacking? Um, this is a map of the official map of the official hackerspaces in the Netherlands um, with, with, with all the names. Tukkelab is here, hello. Um, and th this idea of why, um, I, I've looked at the hackerspaces.org mailing lists. So there is an, an, an announcement list um, which had before April 2024, a message that says, um, should we restart using the announcement and discussion mailing list? The last message before that was in May 2012. So, and if you look at the discussion archives, they're, they're a bit more frequent, but again, you see in July 2024, uh, the whole, um, Downloadable, downloadable version, not even zipped, is 748 bytes. Whereas 10 years ago, the gzipped text was 148k. So there is a reason why they're asking why in hackerspaces. And maybe you can tell us over lunch uh, a bit more about why all those old men with beards and uh, <laughs> where's the youth? Now where's the youth? Hi, um, very, very good question. Yeah, sure. That gap was no communication or another platform that we were using? What happened there? I think there were a lot of technical problems. Okay. And it's all <laughs> 10 years of technical yeah, problems. And, and, and it's all volunteer run, so I yeah. always have to keep something up and running. Yeah, you know, like young volunteers coming in and getting older, having kids, other priorities, oh, this shit server, <laughs> security, and outdated, and pfft, you know how it goes. Right, um, Fab Labs. So I was at the start of the, the Fab Labs in the Netherlands in 2007. This is how it looked in 2009. And this is really, if you go to Wikipedia, this is the picture of a Fab Lab on Wikipedia. I think we should change it to something like that, <laughs> which is my lab at, at Rotterdam University. And um, what I want to illustrate between those two images, there are almost no people, if you look, there's somebody hiding in the corner, in, in the, the darkest corner of the picture. Um, this is a lab full of people. Uh, so again, you know, the, it's not just the hardware. It's more the hacking, which is, a, which is a process, which is a social uh, thing. This is uh, the official map of uh, Fab Labs, taken from the MIT run uh, or sponsor site, with a lot of like gray labs in there that don't exist anymore, and tons of labs uh, looking at the libraries, uh, particularly. Um, 40% of libraries in the Netherlands do have a makerspace. 40%. That's unique globally. Absolutely unique. And you're even pushing that further. You know, every library here in Twente will have a makerspace. So there are the young people coming in again. Hey, hang on. Um, 
in uh, this famous uh, publication, Open Design Now, of which I was uh, an author and editor uh, back in 2011, I drew up that kind of diagram, sort of saying, what are we doing? Are we reproducing or are we generating stuff? And are we more an infrastructure or are we more project oriented? And definitely the hackerspaces and fab labs are moving to generating new stuff, like your, your Anybox, um, and uh, acting between being an infrastructure, a social infrastructure, I should add, and, and working on projects. Um, trying to look at universities in the Netherlands, there's a lot of uh, open hardware going on. This is at TU Delft. Uh, this is at Wageningen, no, this is at, this is at Twente, this is at Wa Wageningen, uh, this is at TU Eindhoven. So you see the TUs coming along quite nicely. And uh, even the University of Utrecht has this uh, proto-lab where apparently some, some open source stuff is going on. Um, I think colleagues might be able to, to fill in that in more detail. Um, there is uh, NWL, which is a, a major uh, academic funding organization in the Netherlands. They do have an open science fund. I looked at their projects, 78 projects. And uh, when you look at university distribution, it's, yes, it's the TUs, the four TUs that are working there. It's the UMCs. Uh, we've heard about open source hardware in, in, in healthcare and medicine. They're quite active. But a lot of other uh, universities are active as well, and if you look at the disciplines um, in, uh, in projects, uh, 32 projects in computer science, 20 com uh, projects in life science, plus 10 in medicine, uh, psychology quite high in the list, computer and humanities quite high in the list, which is interesting, but th I, th I guess that's, that's the link to open science and, and uh, uh, all these uh, uh, ideas and, and activities. There are lesser known things. Anybody heard of the Low Tech Magazine? Power Great. Solar, power. solar powered, so this website might go offline when there is no sun and the battery is down. <laughs> Have a look at it. Very, very, very funny project run by a Dutch guy uh, out of Barcelona. Uh, people might have heard, certainly in the hacker scene, about Koppelting. Uh, in, in Amersfoort, uh, a smallish Dutch uh, hacking event, hacking social, whatever. Um, and this is funny because those uh, pictures turned out upside down, but you can't read it anyway, so it doesn't matter. I just pretend it has to be like that. Uh, there's a project, Meteostat, measure your city. It's very much about air quality. And these are self-built air quality uh, sensors that actually citizen scientists put in their back garden uh, to measure air quality, typically uh, temperature, humidity, um, particles. They're trying to move into CO2 and these kind of things. And um, there is a group in Amersfoort, where the project started. There is a group in Bergen, uh, Norway. What's the name of the project? I don't see it from here. Uh, Meet, yes, um, I'm going to share the, uh, the, the, the presentation with all the URLs. Um, and this is in a, um, and, and the third uh, is in Tilburg, again, a, a city in the Netherlands. Um, a a full project going into art uh, and biology colleague of mine, Roland van Dierendonk, um, biohaptics, sort of uh, an installation, how you, how you interact with, with biology through haptics. There are the, the URLs for these. Um, yeah, why? Um, some of the issues about uh, open hardware uh, and open hardware hacking, uh, and you, you, you know, you might have encountered these when, when working with Latin America uh, and, and Africa. 
uh, the affordances and, and the capacities are very, very different uh, between a fab lab or an industrial uh, woodworking uh, setup or a uh, very manual woodworking setup here in, in, with the example of, of, of the woodworking. So when we discuss open hardware, we don't just discuss, you know, the, 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 the bill of materials and, and the diagrams, but we don't take into account the, capability that, the capabilities that are needed to actually manufacture or make uh, a particular object. And this could be equipment, but this could equally be uh, power supply. This could equally be material supply. Um, this could be material uh, qualities. Um, talking about this project. I just to find it. We've got about three, four minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Um, this particular project, there was an uh, Open Knowledge Festival in Helsinki in 2011 where we run an open design, open hardware uh, stream. And we invited uh, Taylor Hawkinson from the US. He built this desktop CNC machine open source. So he came with the drawings to rebuild the machine in Helsinki. And, oh, my designs are imperial. Helsinki is metric. <laughs> Conversion. Um, I'm using standard MDF. Well, standard MDF in the US is completely different to standard MDF uh, in, in, in Helsinki. Like, you know, the width of the material is different, which impacts your design. You know, when, when this wall is uh, 7 millimeters or 7.8 millimeters, that screws up your machine. So uh, availability of materials, standards, and also take into account uh, uh, circularity. Um, and then this is a funny thing, uh, this is the, the family tree of the RepRap, you know, starting with the RepRap here, um, rebuilding the RepRap, uh, the Ultimaker coming up down there, the latest Prusa somewhere down the line. What you see is it starts with the RepRap and then it explodes. So rather than people contributing to open source hardware, they fork. So is that a not invented here problem? Or is that really um, localization that is needed because of material standards, quality, stuff, stuff like that? And the, 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 big, the big question there is, and I think that what, what, that's what Gosh is about, is that federated learning, how to, how to bring together the experiences that we make across the globe into one design rather than exploding it into thousands of different designs that don't talk to each other. Um, rounding up, um, we shouldn't be bothered too much about the products and the symbols, like your licenses, and is this Creative Commons, or GPL, or CERN, or hours, days, weeks, decades of discussion. Um, look at interactions, look at systems. Um, this is a report that just came out um, in uh, last year. Uh, Again, about open science, uh, areas of ecosystem integrity, and then we go in, into values. And I think that's, that's the reason why we thought, why we, you know, issue a code of conduct, that gosh, in the beginning, because it's, it's all about your, your value systems where um, uh, your, your hacking is embedded in. So that's me, it's, it's, it's this turn black. Um, all, 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 the reference, all the references, I'll, I'll make sure that's, that's turning white. Um, just those photos to remind you, these are uh, blast furnaces. These are early airplanes. These are early computers. This was all open source. So actually engineering comes from open source and copying and sharing. And closing down patents, proprietary stuff, is just an invention of the economy, stupid. Thank you.